All right, welcome back to our daily read aloud. Yesterday we read a bit more and we met a new character named Mr. Ages. Can anyone in here tell me a little bit about Mr. Ages? Emma? He's like a doctor. Okay, he's a doctor. Hayden? Yes, so he knew Mr. Frisbee, who we know died. We don't know how yet, but he was friends with him, and he is very kind. He's helped Timothy before it, because Timothy is frail, and he gets sick easily. Angie? Um, well, Mr. Frisbee is from the, uh, the stuff to, uh, um, uh, to Okay, good. So after she got the medicine at Mr. Age's house, she's walking home, trying to get home before dark because the cat dragon is lurking about, and she sees a crow. So Angie just said the crow got tangled up in a shiny piece of thread because it was shiny and he got excited about it. Okay, so it, it's supposed to be kind of funny. So he got excited about the shiny string and got caught and tangled in the fence. And did Mrs. Frisbee help him? Yes. Yes. Okay, and then what was the very last thing that happened? She said, fly away, and he said, what about the cat? He asked her to do something, and she did it. Madeline? She got on his back. She got on his back. All right, at this point, does anyone have a prediction about what might happen? Zoe? Uh, he might eat her. You think the crow will eat her? Uh, Maybe? No? The cat might eat them. Oh, the cat might eat them. Okay, Josiah? I think the cat's going to jump on to them and then make them fall. Okay. Noah? I think the crow and her are going to fly away and they're going to get, like, lost because he's not, cause he, he's, cause he got tangled up and he said he's only one years old. I don't think he's coordinated enough to do that yet. Yeah, he seems kind of like a silly crow, right? He got himself tangled up just because something was shiny and he was like, oh, look, something shiny. He's only one? He's a young crow. Oh. Okay. Hayden, last comment. Oh, so maybe he'll take her home. All right, lots of good predictions. All right, um, so I will go back and reread a little bit of where we left off. As she finished the second strand, the crow, who was staring towards the house, suddenly cried out. I see the cat. <laughs> Quiet, whispered Mrs. Frisbee. Does he see us? I don't know. Yes, he's looking at me. I don't think he can see you. Stand perfectly still. Don't get in a panic. She did not look up, but started on the third strand. He's moving this way. Fast or slow? Medium. I think he's trying to figure out what I'm doing. She cut through the last strand, gave a tug, and the string fell off. There, you're free. Fly off and be quick. But what about you? Maybe he hasn't seen me. Uh, but he will. He's coming closer. Mrs. Frisbee looked around. There was not a bit of cover anywhere near. Not a rock, nor a hole, nor a log. Nothing at all closer than the chicken yard. And that was in the direction the cat was coming from, and a long way off. Look, said the crow, climb on my back, quick, and hang on. Mrs. Frisbee did what she was told, first grasping the precious packages of medicine tightly between her teeth. Are you on? Yes. She gripped the feathers on his back, felt the, be felt the beat of his powerful black wings, felt a dizzying upward surge, and shut her eyes tight. Just in time, said the crow, and she heard the angry scream of the cat as he leaped where they had just been. It's lucky you're so light. I can scarcely tell you're there. Lucky indeed, thought Mrs. Frisbee. If it had not been for your foolishness, I'd never have gotten into such a scrape. However, she thought it was wise not to say so under the circumstances. If a crow is flying you through the sky, you don't really want to make him mad, right? Because he could fling you off. Where do you live? asked the crow. In the garden patch, near the big stone. I'll drop you off there. He banked alarmingly, and for a moment Mrs. Frisbee thought he meant it literally, like he was going to drop her off. Uh, but a few seconds later, so fast does the crow fly, they were gliding to earth a yard from her front door. Thank you very much, said Mrs. Frisbee, hopping to the ground. 
It's I who should be thanking you, said the crow. You saved my life. And you mine. Ah, but that's not quite even. Yours wouldn't have been risked if it had not been for me. Me and my piece of string. And since this was just what she had been thinking, Mrs. Frisbee did not argue. We all help one another against the cat, she said. True. Just the same, I am in debt to you. What does that mean, if you're in debt to someone? Noah? You owe them something. Yeah, you owe them something. So debts, usually it's money. If you owe someone money, you owe them a debt. But it can mean anything. So basically, uh, he owes her a favor. Um, I am in debt to you. If the time ever comes when I can help you, I hope you will ask me. My name is Jeremy. Mention it to any crow you see in these woods and he will find me. Thank you, said Mrs. Frisbee. I will remember. Jeremy flew away to the woods and she entered her house, taking the three doses of medicine with her. All right, the next chapter is called Mr. Fitzgibbon's Plow. All right, now based on that title, we know the mice live underground, right? Do we know what a plow does to the ground? Oh. Hudson, what's a plow do? Um, it, um, it like digs up the, um, dirt. So, if you were a tiny little family of mice living underground, what might that cause trouble? Um, How would that be a problem? Um, kill their home? Yeah, it could smash up their home. If they were inside it, it could smash them, right? Yeah. And a plow has sharp blades. Mm -hmm. So for little animals that burrow underground, they have to be careful about when the plow comes through. Little bones. Cadence? That's why they have to move. Oh, Cadence thinks maybe that's why they have to move. Maybe this is a yearly adventure. Every year they have to move their house out of the plow area. We'll find out. When Mrs. Frisbee went into her house, she found Timothy asleep and the other children waiting, frightened, sad, and subdued. Subdued means kind of quiet. He went to sleep right after you left, Teresa said. He's waked up twice, and the second time he wasn't delirious. He said his chest hurt and his head hurt. But mother, he seemed so weak. He could hardly talk. He asked where you were, and I told him. Then he went back to sleep. Mr. Frisbee, you know, I read this last year. It does say Mr. Frisbee, but he's not alive. It should say Mrs. Mrs. Frisbee went to where Timothy lay. A small ball of damp fur curled under a bit of cloth blanket. He looked scarcely larger than he had when she and Mr. Frisbee had carried him to Mr. Ages as an infant. And the thought of that trip made her wish Mr. Frisbee were alive, to reassure the children and tell them not to worry. But he was not, and it was she who must say it. Don't worry, she said. Mr. Ages gave me some medicine for him and says he will recover. She mixed the contents of one of the packets, a gray-green powder, in water, and then gently shook Timothy awake. He smiled. You're back! He said it in a voice as small as a whisper. I'm back, and I've brought you some medicine. Mr. Aegis says it will make you all right. She lifted his head on her arm, and he swallowed the medicine. I expect it's bitter, she said. It's not so bad, he said. It tastes like pepper. And he fell back to sleep immediately. The next morning, as predicted, his fever was lower, his breathing grew easier, and his heartbeat slowed down. Still, that day he slept seven hours out of each eight. The next day he stayed awake longer. And on the third day, he had no fever at all, just as Mr. Ages had said. However, since Mr. Ages had been right in all that, Mrs. Frisbee knew he was sure to have been right in the other things he said. Timothy was not really strong yet. He must stay in bed, stay warm, and breathe only warm air. So basically, he can't go outside, right? During those three days, she had stayed close by his side. But on the fourth, she felt cheerful enough to go for a walk and also to fetch some more of the corn from the stump so they could have it for supper. She went out her front door into the sunshine and was surprised to find a spring day waiting for her. The weather had turned warm while she stayed indoors. February was over and March had come in, as they say, like a lamb. There was a smell of dampness in the air as the frosted ground thawed, a smell of things getting ready to grow. It made her feel even more cheerful than before, and she walked almost happily across the garden. And yet, despite the fine warmth of the day, indeed in a way because of it, Mrs. Frisbee could not quite get rid of a nagging worry that kept flickering in her mind. 
It was the kind of worry that if you push it out of the corner of your thoughts, it pops up in that corner and finally in the middle where it has to be faced. It was the thought of moving day. Everybody knows that the groundhog comes up from the deep hole where he slept the winter, looks around, and if he decides the cold weather is not over, goes back down to sleep for another six weeks. Field mice like Mrs. Frisbee are not so lucky. When winter is over, they must move out of the garden and back to the meadow or the pasture. For as soon as the weather allows, Farmer Fitzgibbon's tractor comes rumbling through, pulling the sharp-bladed plow through the soil, turning over every foot of it. No animal caught in the garden that day is likely to escape alive. And all the winter homes, all the tunnels and holes and nests and cocoons are torn up. After the plow comes the harrow with its heavy creaking discs and then the people with hoes and seeds. Not all the field mice move into the garden for the winter, of course. Some find their way into barn lofts. Some even creep into people's houses to live under the, the eaves or in the attic, taking their chances with mouse traps. But the frisbees had always come to the garden, preferring the relative safety and freedom of the outdoors. Moving day, therefore, depends on the weather. And that is why a fine day set Mrs. Frisbee worrying, even as she enjoyed it. As soon as the frost was out of the ground, the plow would come. And that could happen as much as a month earlier or later, one year than the last. And the worry was this. If it came too soon, Timothy would not be able to move. He was supposed to stay in bed, and moving meant a long walk across the field of winter wheat up and down the hill to the brook's edge, where the Frisbees made their summer home. A brook is like a little river. Uh, lost my spot. Not only that, the home itself would be damp and chilly for the first few weeks, as summer homes always are, until early spring turned to late spring and the nights grew truly warm. This was something that Mrs. Frisbee and the children did not ordinarily mind. Moving day, in fact, was normally a happy time, for it marked the end of the gray weather and the frost. It was like the beginning of a summer holiday. But this year, now that Mrs. Frisbee had faced the problem, she did not see any answer except to hope that the day would not come too early. In another month, according to Mr. Ages, Timothy would be strong enough. Perhaps she was only borrowing trouble. One warm day, she told herself, does not make a summer. No, nor even a spring. She walked on through the garden and saw ahead of her a small figure she knew. It was the Lady Shrew, a tiny thing, scarcely bigger than a peanut, but with a wit as sharp as her teeth. So a shrew is kind of like a little tiny groundhog thing. It's a little, like a mole. Mm -hmm. She lived in a simple hole in the ground a few yards away. Mrs. Frisbee met her often and had grown to like her, even though shrews are generally unpopular, having a reputation for short tempers and extremely large appetites. Good morning, said Mrs. Frisbee. Ah, Mrs. Frisbee, good morning indeed. Too good it is, is what I'm thinking. The shrew was holding a stalk of straw, which she now thrust into the earth. It went down easily for two inches or more before it bent in her hand. Look at that. The top of the frost is gone already. Another few days like this and it will be all gone. Then we will have the tractor in here again, breaking everything up. So soon? Do you really think so? asked Mrs. Frisbee her worry returning in a rush, stronger than before. He plows when the frost is gone. Remember the spring of 65? That year he plowed on the 11th day of March, and on a Sunday at that. I moved down to the woods that night and nearly froze to death in a miserable hollow log. And that day came after a week of days just like this. Mrs. Frisbee did remember it. Her family, too, had shivered through those chilly nights. For the fact was... The earlier moving day came, the colder the nights were likely to be. Oh dear, she said. I hope it doesn't happen this year. Poor Timothy's too sick to move. Sick is he? Take him to Mr. Ages. I've been myself, but he's too weak to get out of the bed and still is. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Then we must hope for another frost or that the tractor will break down. I wish someone would drive a tractor through his house and see how he likes it. So muttering, the Lady Shrew moved off, and Mrs. Frisbee continued across the garden. The remark was illogical, of course, for they both knew that without Mr. Fitzgibbon's plow, there would be no garden to live in at all, 
and there would be no way he could turn the earth without also turning up their houses. Or was there? What the shrew had said was meant to be sympathetic, but it was not helpful. It meant, Mrs. Frisbee realized, that she too could see no solution to the problem. But that did not mean that there was none. She remembered something her husband, Mr. Frisbee, used to say. All doors are hard to unlock until you have the key. All right, she must try to find the key. But where? Whom to ask? And then, as if to make things worse, she heard a sound that filled her with alarm. It came from across the fence in the farmyard, a loud, sputtering roar. It was Mr. Fitzgibbon starting his tractor. And that is where we will stop. See you guys tomorrow.